Now I just want to look at a restatement of the fundamental theorem of calculus as it's often used in applications in engineering and science. So this is a, the net change theorem, and this is really just a restatement of the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. I mean, have a look at it. The integral from a to b of big F prime of x dx, how would we evaluate that? We'd need an antiderivative of big F prime. Well, an antiderivative of big F prime would be big F. So we'd take big F, evaluate it at the endpoints, and take their difference. So nothing more than a restatement of the fundamental theorem of calculus. But we call it the net change theorem because what it's really saying is that if you take an integral of a rate of change, you get the net change in the function. So how could this be useful? Well, let's just look at a couple of examples to see. So suppose little f of x is the slope of a hiking trail. And the thing to keep in mind here is that this is a slope of a hiking trail. What do we mean by slope of a hiking trail? Well, that's a rate of change. The slope of a hiking trail would be the rate of change in elevation over sort of the distance traveled. So maybe the distance traveled, horizontal distance traveled, the rate of change in the elevation. Uh, so f of x is the slope of a hiking trail. It is the rate of change of some quantity. So what is it the rate of change of? Well, maybe I'll, I'll use h of x, where h of x is the elevation of the trail at position x. And x is um, a distance measured in miles from the start of the trail. So little f is a rate of change. Question's asking us to interpret what the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx represents. Well, let's just see. The integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx is, well, that's the integral from 2 to 4 of h prime of x dx. Well, that's just h of 4 minus h of 2. What is h of 4 minus h of 2? Well, it's the elevation at position 4 minus the elevation at position 2. I start at position uh, x equals 2. I move along the trail. I end at an elevation uh, at position x equals 4. So h of 4 minus h of 2 is just the net change in elevation. So this is the net change in elevation. So it's the net change, net change in elevation, i.e. It is the difference in starting height with ending height along the trail. So you integrate the slope of the trail, and what you get is net change in elevation. Let's look at another example. Here is an example from physics where we're looking at a particle that's moving along a line, and we're given its acceleration. And now we're asked questions about velocity and distance traveled. So the acceleration at time t is 2t plus 3. The initial velocity is negative 4 meters per second. Remember, the negative in the velocity here indicates direction. So if we think that this direction is the negative direction, this direction is the positive direction, then v of 0 equals negative 4 means it's traveling in this direction or to your left at 4 meters per second. If the velocity was positive, it would be traveling in this direction. So let's find the velocity at times t. At time t. How do we do this? Well, we have that the acceleration, which is 2t plus 3, that's a rate of change. That's v prime of t. So how can we start with the rate of change and get back the original function? So how can we start with v prime and get back to v? That's what the net change theorem is saying. It says you can use an integral to get that. Or in other words, if I know v prime, I could use an antiderivative to get to v. Really this exact same thing, net change theorem and this relationship with the antiderivative. So what I can do is I can look at it this way. By the net change theorem, we have that v of t minus v of 0 
the change in the velo the net change in velocity over the time interval from zero to t is the integral from zero to t of v prime of t dt, which is the integral from zero to t of a of t dt. And a of t is two t plus three. Now, one thing I should maybe note here, it's a good point to, to make at this time, is I've got t acting in two different ways here. I've got t as my limit of integration and t as my variable of integration. This is where it's a good idea to switch your variable of integration to another variable. Because remember, variables of integration are dummy variables. They get integrated away. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch my variable of integration to an x. I just want to change it. So I'm switching it to an x. I'll erase these ones just so it's easier to see. x, x, and x, and x. It's always a good idea to not use the same variable in the limit of integration as the uh, integration variable itself. So now at this stage, what's the antiderivative? Well, that would be x squared plus 3x. And we're going from 0 to t. And so this is t squared plus 3t. That's v of t minus v of 0. So v of t, the velocity at any time t, is equal to t squared plus 3t plus v0. Or in other words, v of t is equal to t squared plus 3t minus 4. So there's our velocity at any given time. So we've done part A, found the velocity at any given time. Now what about the distance traveled during that time interval? So we'll go to work on part B. Distance traveled. So what is the distance traveled? Well, here, let's just get an idea. So velocity, maybe we'll factor this just to see where it's positive and where it's negative. So this would be t plus 4 t minus 1. That's how we factor that. And so, quick sketch, just to get an idea of what the velocity looks like. It's a quadratic function, so it looks like a parabola opening upwards. It's got a root at negative 4 and another root at 1, so it passes here. When t is 0, it's down here at negative 4. And so it goes up like this until we get over here. The end of our time interval is 3, so we're going from 0 out to 3. And so there is our velocity function over time t. Now what we notice with this is that the velocity is negative on the interval from 0 to 1. So on the interval from 0 to 1, it's heading in this direction. Then afterwards, it turns around and it starts to head to the right. And that's from 1 to 3. Now we're looking at the total distance traveled. So I need to know how far does it travel to the left plus how far does it travel to the right. Note I'm not looking for the displacement here. I'm not looking for the displacement, the difference between the starting and the end points. So I will make a note of this. We don't want displacement. What is displacement? Displacement would be the difference between the starting and the end points. How would we find the difference between the starting and the end points? Well, that's the net change theorem. The net change theorem would just say take the integral from 0 to 3 of the velocity function, and that would give you the difference between the starting and the end points, or its displacement. But we want distance traveled. So think about it this way. Suppose I started at a point and I move to the left and then move back to where I started. My displacement would be zero in that case. However, I did travel some distance. I traveled a bunch to the left and then a bunch to the right. I'm interested in different distance traveled in this question. I'm not interested in displacement. So I don't want to compute the integral from zero to three of v of t dt. What I do want to compute, we do want distance traveled. So how do we get that? Well, the 
way to get distance traveled is first strip all the signs away from the velocity. Just imagine that the particles all traveling in the same direction. It's not moving to the left at all. It's entirely moving to the right. Just imagine that. Then if we integrate, we're going to get the total distance traveled. So the way we do this is we take the integral from 0 to 3 of the absolute value of the velocity. Strip away all signs. Now why is that? Well, you can think about it this way. Displacement is the integral of the velocity. Distance traveled is the integral of the speed. Absolute value of velocity is speed. We've stripped away all signs. So speed is just the, the magnitude of the velocity. It doesn't care about direction. It just wants to know how fast are you traveling. Whereas velocity has a direction of component associated with it, positive or negative. So this is what we want to compute. We want to compute the integral of the absolute value. So we're looking at a function that then looks like this. This is the one we're looking at here. So that is the absolute value of the velocity, whereas this one here was just the velocity itself. So how do we compute this integral? Well, we're going to have to split it up. We're going to look at where the velocity is positive and where it's negative because the absolute value uh, affects the function depending on whether it was positive or negative in different ways. So the integral, we're going to split up 0 to 1 and the absolute value of the velocity would be negative v of t because the velocity would have been negative there so slapping an extra negative sign is equivalent to taking its absolute value plus the integral from 1 to 3 of, well the function is positive already so we can ignore the absolute value. And now we go to work on these individual integrals. That's from 0 to 1 of negative t squared. Actually, I'll push the negative outside. And that's t squared plus 3t minus 4 dt plus the integral from 1 to 3 of t squared plus 3t minus 4 dt. And in this case, the antiderivative of the integrand is the same in both cases because I pushed the negative sign up front so it's actually the same integrand in both cases now. So this is one-third t cubed plus three-halves t squared minus four t. We only need one antiderivative so I don't even need to bother with the plus c here. I just need one antiderivative because I'm evaluating a definite integral. Um, if you wanted to add a plus c in there, it would cancel off anyway because you'd be taking the difference evaluated at the upper limit of integration minus the lower limit of integration and the c's would cancel off. So you don't need to worry about a plus c here, only when you're doing indefinite integrals. Definite integrals, you don't need to worry about the plus c, you just need one antiderivative. Uh, and now this is again one-third t cubed minus, or sorry, plus three-halves t squared minus four t. And now we pop our limits of integration in. So one third plus three halves minus four. And plugging zero in, everything's just zero anyway. And then we get a one third, uh, sorry, a one third three cubed plus three halves three squared minus four times three is 12. And then minus the expression when you plug the one in. So that's a one third plus 3 halves minus 4. And then we go to work on just uh, simplifying this expression and we get a result of 89 sixths. And let's just check what is our unit of measure here? Meters. So we've traveled, it's traveled a distance of 89 over 6 meters. It might be worth pointing out at this stage that we really worked out two integrals here. We worked out this one, which is essentially the distance it traveled to the left. As the particle's moving left, that's how far it traveled. The negative sign in front is required because the integral would have been negative. The integral would have been negative. It would have been the displacement from where it started at zero to where it ended at one. And since it's traveling to the left, its displacement would have been negative. So that extra negative out front turned that displacement into a distance. So that's how far it traveled to the left. 
Then we worked out how far it traveled to the right. Again, a positive quantity, that's the distance it traveled to the right, and we added those two results together. If we didn't have that negative sign there, we just worked out the integral from 0 to 1 and the integral from 1 to 3 of the velocity function, we'd be staring at this quantity, which would be the displacement, the net change in its position, where it started, or where it ended, I should say, minus where it started from. So that would be displacement. That would be this one. It wouldn't take into account that it moved to the left first and then moved to the right. All it would care is if you start here, no matter what you do, I don't care, wherever you end up, we're just looking at the difference between where you started and where you ended. That's what this integral does. It doesn't care about what went on between. We had to actually physically look at what went on between, in between, and work out all the stopping points where direction changed and then look at the individual integrals to find distances traveled on each of those segments. That's what we did here. It turned out that there was two segments, one to the left and one to the right, and then we had to add them up independently. So a little bit of thought was involved here when we're trying to find distance traveled. All right, so that's it for these examples on the net change theorem and, and uh, this uh, lecture on the indefinite integral. Next lecture, we're going to look at the substitution rule or an integra integration technique on how to essentially undo the chain rule. From, differentiation, from differential calculus, we learned the chain rule to differentiate composition of functions. How can we now start with a function that came from a derivative using the chain rule and reverse it to find the antiderivative? So essentially, substitution rule we're going to look at is how to undo the chain rule, and that's next.